Hey there, this is James Carberry, founder of Sweetfish Media and one of the co-hosts of this show. For the last year and a half, I've been working on my very first book. In the book, I share the three-part framework we've used as the foundation for our growth here at Sweetfish. Now, there are lots of companies that have raised a bunch of money and have grown insanely fast, and we featured a lot of them here on the show. We've decided to bootstrap our business, which usually equates to pretty slow growth. But using the strategy outlined in the book, we're on pace to be one of Inc.'s fastest growing companies in 2020. The book is called Content-Based Networking, How to Instantly Connect with Anyone You Want to Know. If you're a fan of audiobooks like me, you can find the book on Audible, or if you like physical books, you can also find it on Amazon. Just search content-based networking or James Carberry, C-A-R-B-A-R-Y in Audible or Amazon, and it should pop right up. All right, let's get into the show. Hey everybody, Logan with Sweetfish here. As we've been doing all month long, we continue our countdown of the top 20 episodes of 2019 here in our hashtag best of 2019 series. Coming in at number seven is a conversation with VP of Thought Leadership at Diligent Corporation, Dottie Schindlinger. She's also the host of the Corporate Director Podcast. Thought Leadership came up in a lot of conversations both here on the podcast and offline with marketing leaders throughout 2019. So I think you guys will enjoy this conversation about three reasons to build a thought leadership discipline within your organization. To get more episodes coming up in the countdown, make sure you're subscribed to the show in Apple Podcasts or wherever you do your listening. You can also check out the full list at sweetfishmedia.com slash blog. Just look for the hashtag best of 2019 in the categories on the right-hand side of that page. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivey with Sweetfish Media. I've got with me today, Dottie Schindlinger, who is VP of Thought Leadership at Diligent Corporation. How are you doing today, Dottie? I'm doing great, Nikki. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Hey, no problem. I'm I'm super excited to get into what we're going to talk about today. We're going to be talking about building a thought leadership discipline within an organization and why it's important to be intentional about that sort of thing. But before we dig into all of that, Dottie, I'd love for you to just give us a little bit of background on yourself and, and what you and the folks at Diligent have been up to these days. Sure. Um, so it's probably helpful if I just explain what Diligent is as well. So Diligent Corporation is uh, primarily a software company that focuses on providing solutions to uh, corporate leaders and board members of organizations around the globe. So as an enterprise, we work with about 650,000 senior leaders of companies and organizations in the corporate space and the nonprofit space, really all over the world. And so we spend a lot of our time thinking and talking, eating, sleeping, and breathing board governance. <laughs> so we are, we are a lot of us kind of governance geeks. You know, we spend a lot of time writing about these issues, thinking about these issues, talking about these issues. And so that's, that's actually sort of where I came from. I've been working in governance for about 20 years in a variety of different roles. Uh, the reason I came to Diligent was that prior to Diligent, I helped to get a company off the ground called Board Effect, which was acquired by Diligent at the end of 2016. And I had the great good fortune at that time to be asked if I'd like to come and join the Diligent team and sort of help with the development of a thought leadership enterprise enterprise for diligent. And so that's what I'm doing now. So it's, it's been really exciting to get into this role and uh, very rewarding to be part of this exciting new venture at diligent. Yeah, it, it is exciting. And I can't wait to hear more about it because here's the thing, right? Everybody and their little cousin is talking about thought leadership and, and they're doing it uh, at the individual level, folks making use of, of LinkedIn and, and, and you see certain folks within an organization trying to advance that initiative, or maybe even, you know, at the C-suite level, folks throwing budget at it, but not being as intentional as saying, hey, we're going to have someone who owns this endeavor as a rule. So talk a little bit about, Dottie, about why you guys felt it was important to do, to take that step. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you're so right, Nick. I mean, it can happen at lots of different levels, but you you know, it's it's so much better when you think about it as a very intentional uh, approach and a very intentional project. And the reason that's so much better and, and a really, I think the way that companies should think about going is that when you are in a particular field, you will acquire knowledge and information about that field that is going to be unique and different from really anyone else in the world. There is something that you know. It doesn't really matter what business your company is in. There is something that you know or have, have gotten to know that is different and special 
from others. And so if you can turn that special something into content that is of interest to your market, you can really kind of corner the conversation on that topic. And then you can be, your company can become associated with being very knowledgeable and being very authentic and genuine in providing educational information about that topic. And that's, that's exceptionally important for brand recognition. Um, it also just helps to build trust with your customer base. Because what they really want, first and foremost, every B2B business, we all want customers that want to partner with us, right? We don't want them just to come and buy from us one time. We want them to come back to us. We want them to work with us and we want to educate them. We want them to educate us. We want that to be a partnership. And in order to develop that kind of a relationship with your customers, you really have to build trust. And one of the best ways to build trust is to provide something of value that people you know, recognize has value and to do it in an authentic way. And I think thought leadership is really at the center of all of that. And I'll give you a, a quick example. One of the things that we're doing at Diligent right now is talking about what, what we're calling modern governance, which is really, you know, board governance has been the same, really going all the way back to the 1680s when the Bank of England first sort of defined what corporate governance would look like. And so, you know, here we are, it's 2019, and we're still kind of using a system that came into place in the 1680s, or maybe it was the 1640s in the Bank of England. And so we've been saying, you know, we don't really live in that world anymore. <laughs> there are these things called Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn, you know, all these different ways that we get information now. I mean, in particular, if I think about Twitter, right? If you're a corporate leader these days, you could walk in one morning and there could be a hashtag me too tweet that will completely upend every plan you had for the next four months, right? So, right. so um, you know, we have, to, we have to really modernize governance to fit the reality that we live in. So we've been talking a lot about this idea of modern governance. And modern governance is not like the name of a product that we sell or the name of a piece of software that we have. It's really an idea around the work that we do. And so as we're starting to talk about this idea of modern governance, really the only way to do it is to talk about, well, what are board practices? What do they look like? What have they looked like? How are they evolving? Let's talk to directors. What do they think is happening? All of that becomes thought leadership. And so it's not, you know, it doesn't have a one-to-one -one direct correlation to some type of a sales play. Mm -hmm. It's all about how do we teach the market what we are learning? You know, we have this incredible access to this huge group of leaders well, that should hopefully lend some knowledge to us. <laughs> so how do we take that knowledge and make it useful to our market and share it back out with people? Yeah, that, that last piece is sort of at the center, certainly at the center of why Sweetfish Media exists. I mean, honestly, right. that's the question, right? How exactly. Do we, take, we have access to leaders. How do we take this and, and make it something valuable? And, and you know, a question popped into my head. When I talk to marketers every day on this show and... When I talk to marketers, we do talk about thought leadership, and I'm interested in what you think is the difference between the way a dedicated VP of thought leadership approaches uh, branding and thought leadership versus the mm -hmm. way it would look under, uh, or the way you've seen it look under the marketing umbrella. What are some of the differences there? Yeah, so that's really interesting. I mean, so so as a company, so I, I actually am part of the marketing team, but in a sort of a separate silo from what we would call sort of our our demand generation unit, which sure. is all about kind of creating content about building demand, you know, providing things that um, really interest people and kind of drive them to our websites and things like that. And, and thought leadership works very closely with that team. I mean, we mm -hmm. work, you know, very closely together, but we're a little bit different because I think what we're trying to do as a thought leadership team is try to figure out what is on the minds of the people that we're working with? And then try to provide them information of value on those issues related to things that we know that may, they may not know. And that's different, I would say, from doing something that is much more focused around sales and marketing, which would be, sure. let's tell them something we want to tell them about us. Right? So we're, we're trying to say, hey, we have, this, we have this incredible access to information that you might not have. We know you're interested in this issue. And here's what we can tell you about that issue. And that issue, whatever it is, may have nothing at all to do with our software, may have nothing at all to do with anything that we sell, but we know it's something on your mind and we have this incredible access. And so we're going to provide that for you as a service, just as a way of saying, we get you, we hear you, we know this is important and we're going to provide this to you. So it's just a little bit of a different mindset. Yeah, this is so important. And, and what you're talking about is what I see this difference playing out. I think you and I were talking offline about but what happens on, on LinkedIn where, you know, you'll have 
there are those folks whose posts are whose posts and and whose content that is and and whose outreach on LinkedIn is very obviously geared at getting folks to work with them uh, and and having more of a one to one sales correlation like you mentioned and then there are those folks who is like I'm interested in what folks in this industry are up against and how I can help with that so it is understanding that difference and one of the ways that you and I talked about as far as advancing a thought leadership initiative, you know, as it differs from marketing initiatives is leveraging mm-hmm. internal and external evangelists. Talk a little bit about that for me real quick. Yeah, I'm happy to. And I, when, when I was, you know, just sort of wrapping up my final couple of years with Board Effect before we got acquired, I had sort of taken on the role of being our technology evangelist. And then I, I started in that role at Diligent and now am really overseeing everything we're doing around thought leadership. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a role that's very near and dear to my heart because it's, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of sales, a little bit of partnerships, and a lot of just helping people to connect with your company and your mission and your product in a meaningful and authentic way. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's, and I think when you are creating evangelists, whether they are internal to your company, they're people that work at your company, or they're customer evangelists, people on the outside who just become super excited about what you do and they can't wait to tell their friends and family all about it. What you really want to try to do is make sure two things. One is that it is absolutely authentic. It cannot be fake. You really have to genuinely believe and have data to back up that what you are saying is accurate. Um, So that's really, really important step number one. Step number two is it has to be something of value to the person you're speaking with. And I think that's that's a place where I see sometimes thought leadership going a little bit awry or things that is things that are called thought leadership that I would say they're probably not really thought leadership. They're more like clickbait. <laughs> right. You know, where it's it's, hey, I'm gonna say a bunch of words that I think you'll be interested in. And when you click on them, there's not really a there there. It just ends up being kind of fluff. Um, and there's not really any real meat to it. I, that's very different in my mind from what real thought leadership is. What real thought leadership is, is I have something that I know because of my access to information or because of what I do for a living that I'm going to share with you that is meaningful to you because I know this is a topic that's on your mind. And I'm not trying to sell you something with it. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to give you something you don't already know. And it's new. You know, it's some new information. It's not already been done somewhere else a thousand times, or it's a new spin on an old topic because I have a different perspective based on what I do for a living, right? So all of that can be broadcast through what I would say the evangelist channel. And that can be, you know, in presentations at conferences, it could be on podcasts, it could be on, you know, any type of a webinar. And and you can you can sort of take that that message of here's how you can connect to something that we know about. Um, here's what we can offer back of value to you. And I'm going to tell you all this stuff, not because I'm trying to sell you something right now, but because I want you to understand you can trust me. Mm-hmm. And because you can trust me, you might be interested to know more about what I do. It's really about building that trust and building that uh, corpus of information that's helpful to people based on what they're already interested in. Does that make sense? Imagine it, a spreadsheet filled with rows and rows of your sales enablement assets. You've devoted two years to organizing this masterpiece only for it to stop making sense. This was Chad Trabuco's reality. As the head of sales enablement at Glint, a LinkedIn company, he's responsible for instilling confidence in his sales reps and arming them with the information they need to do their jobs. However, when his glorious spreadsheet became too complex, he realized he needed a new system. That's when Chad turned to Guru. With Guru, the knowledge you need to do your job finds you. Between Guru's web interface, Slack integration, mobile app, and browser extension, teams can easily search for verified knowledge without leaving their workflow. No more siloed or staled information. Guru acts as your single source of truth. For Chad, this meant Glint sales reps were left feeling more confident doing their jobs. See why leading companies like Glint, Shopify, Spotify, Slack, and more are using Guru for their knowledge management needs. Visit b2bgrowth.getguru.com to start your 30-day free trial and discover how knowledge management can empower your revenue teams. Yeah, perfect sense. And the question that comes to mind though, because I know that a lot of the, a lot of the conversations I'm having with, with marketers, uh, e- even those who are, especially those who are talking about their own thought leadership initiatives have not taken the step that you've taken that's just flat out from the beginning saying, no, I am not trying to make a one-to-one 
sales correlation. So in the absence of that, though, and in the absence of, you know, it being a demand gen thing, how are we measuring? What are we what are we measuring? How are we setting goals? How do we know it's working? Yeah, that's a really important question. I mean, and just to be clear, I'm not saying that it's completely divorced of sales, right? So, sure, I mean, yeah. obviously we're we're all in business for a reason. Like we're you know, we're not just doing this for our health, right? So, so, I mean, clearly at the end of the day, it should lead in some way back to some positive traction in the, in the numbers game. But but really, I think one of the ways you can measure it, a couple of things. One is you can sort of measure share of voice. So you can kind of look out in the market and see, you know, all the conversations happening on social media and in print media and, you know, et cetera, and sort of see, you know, all the different conversations happening around a particular topic, what percentage of those are attrib- attributable back to you and to your efforts. And that can be a metric that you can use. Um, another way that you can sort of think about thought leadership as being important is just brand reputation, right? So how does it positively impact your brand? Does it um, help people want to be part of your brand because what you're doing is so interesting and so relevant to them and resonates so strongly with them that they're more likely to be brand loyal and they're more likely to tell lots of people about you, right? You can look at your net promoter score. Like you should definitely be seeing it, you know, sort of a a needle moving on the net promoter score. If people feel very strongly about your brand because everything you've been telling them and sharing with them is so positive and good and they can trust you, you know, it, it's going to make you more resilient if your product one day isn't 100% perfect, mm-hmm. right? They're not going to be willing to just throw you out the door because of one glitch. They're going to say, well, okay, it was one little glitch. That's not awesome, but this is a good company and I can right. trust them and I believe in them and they give me lots of things of value, not just this one product, right? So it's, it's really kind of, you're looking at those metrics mm-hmm. um, as much as you would look at any, you know, you can also obviously take thought leadership and then use it for demand generation. For sure. <laughs> so for you sure. can really clearly make that pathway. Yeah. <laughs> but in and the beginning, that's not necessarily the point. Right. Yeah. And so the reason why I asked that question is because one of my goals as a takeaway from this conversation for our listeners, and I think you've done a great job of giving them this, was those folks who want to get started, I want them to feel or who, who want to lobby for this in their own organizations, I want them to feel armed with that kind of information because these are the kinds of questions that if they're going to get pushback, these are the kind of questions folks are going to ask. Right. And yeah. so that, that was my, my last question for you on the subject is, you know, what advice would you give for folks who are trying to start this, fight this good fight and start this initiative at their own organization? Yeah, I would, I would say there's another... So I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because there's another sort of important component to this that is helpful to just mention. And that is the utility of having a thought leadership enterprise for the internal team as well. And, I, and I'll, I'll give an example, right? So our sales team spends a lot of time speaking with prospective customers about our software and hopefully engaging with them to try to get them to implement the software with their board of directors. Now, not a lot of our sales team members have a 20-year experience in board governance, right? So, you know, they'll be on the phone with a company secretary or general counsel, and they are experts in our software, but they might not know all the ins and outs of exactly what those folks do on a daily basis. And they might not really fully understand a question that they get asked, right? They might get asked a question about some very specific issue that that person is dealing with, and they want to know how to do this in the software and they might get stuck. And so one of the other benefits of having thought leadership is then it gives the internal sales team a place to turn where they can A, educate themselves more about your market, but B, give them other things to talk about. Right, Because if all salespeople are doing is just talking about, here's this nice button that you press and here's what it does when you press it, that's not going to really create that positive brand feeling for the customer. It's not going right. to build customer loyalty. It's not going to build customer evangelists. It's not going to really give you that, that same stickiness that you want. Versus if the person's having a conversation of, hey, you know, we just did this research report out of our institute. And it found, you know, X percent of people like you have this experience. And here's what we think is really important about that. And by the way, that's one of the reasons that our software does the following. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a dramatically different conversation. And it's going to make the customer feel so much better that they're working with a company that thinks in this way. Mm-hmm. And that is investing in providing that kind of intelligence that they can actually benefit from. But it's also they're benefiting from the fact that they're now working with a salesperson that knows this yeah. and can say it with confidence. So I think there's a there's a sort of a whole other component of thought leadership, which is how it benefits the company, how it benefits the internal team. 
I mean, absolutely. I've seen, there's a company I worked for. It used to be called uh, Kinzer. Um, it's a, a healthcare software, a EMR software. It's now called WellSky. They've blown up super successful folks. And one of the things they built this company on before thought leadership became such a buzzy term um, was doing just that, was offering, like you're talking about, valuable resources that came from this really deep understanding about what the day-to-day was of folks working in that industry at every level. And you're so right about what the way that it armed we as salespeople. For instance, if they were having a, a webinar, right, that was part of this thought leadership initiative, sales folks, even the SDRs, which I was at this institution, uh, as an organization, were to sit in on these webinars. Yeah. So that, like you're saying, it, there's a difference between I know my marketing team just released a new white paper. There's a difference between me having a conversation, someone asking me a question and me saying, I don't know, I'll email you this white paper. And right. me being able to intelligently speak to the problems that these people face or intelligently speak exactly. to where the industry is going next. So that I think is so key is thought, the, the thought leadership of VP of thought leadership or the thought leadership department itself modeling for salespeople and for the sales team how to talk about what it's really like at the at right. the ground level in in those uh, organizations. So this is so good. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's almost just kind of giving back, right? It's like, hey, we are learning so much by working with this massive market. We got to give something back. Like, there, yeah. there's got to be something that we can do to share what we're learning. And I think that sharing happens both internally and externally. I mean, it helps everyone. It helps the customer. It helps the company. It helps the salespeople. If we all just get a little smarter. You know, if we all just know a little bit more about the market that we're working in. So I feel like it's the kind of discipline that, you know, it may not always be obvious to people why you would invest in it. But once you have it and you see the power that is that is truly inherent in having a strong thought leadership discipline, it's hard to live without it. You know, because you you realize how much uh, how much more attractive your company has become by being the one that knows stuff. <laughs> and can share it articulately. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. This was perfect. Like I said, I think everything that I wanted folks to get out of this conversation and take into their respective organizations, you've done uh, a masterful job at, at giving us that. And it's been fun too. Because um, <laughs> sometimes you get one or the other. It has, I gotta Mickey. be honest with you, Dottie. Um, all right. So yes. now one of my favorite parts of, of the B2B growth shows is when uh, after I've finished picking your brain and see what I can get out of it. I am going to find out what you put in it, Dottie. What have you been, <laughs> what have you been reading? What learning resource have you been engaging with these days that's got you excited or is informing your approach? Well, so Nikki, I hate to be a little bit self-serving, but I, I have to tell you that this is really the God's honest truth. I've been reading my own book. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, and I really do mean this because I've been on a global book tour for the last five weeks. So, well, um, let's see. This makes yeah, sense. So, so I really have been reading it because I've had to talk about it a lot. But um, so the book that we wrote is the uh, Governance in the Digital Age: A Guide for the Modern Corporate Board Director. And really, this is a book that I'd been thinking about writing for about fifteen years. What we tried to do was, you know, again, we work with all of these organizations all around the world. We work with their corporate leaders. We wanted to understand what is changing about corporate governance in this time when information moves at the speed of a tweet? Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to know how are boards dealing with this? And and are there any lessons learned that we can use? (laughs) So, So we did a lot of research. We did a lot of interviews with people. We wanted to understand what's working. I feel like there's a lot of stuff written about what goes badly wrong. There's not nearly enough stuff written about what goes right. So we tried to even that score a little bit by writing this book and trying to provide some examples of things that can go right. So not to be too self-serving, but this is actually what I've been spending a lot of time talking about and thinking about for the last (laughs) several months. No, no, that's... I'm with it. Get it, girl. Governance in the digital (laughs) age. Okay. And so I know that like me, uh, folks listening to this are going to be inspired and want to follow along uh, with the content that you are putting out as as a thought leader uh, and VP of thought leadership for Diligent. How can folks best connect with you, Dottie? Yeah, um, so I'm pretty easily available. So a couple things. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. If you just look for GovTech Geek, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, that's also my Twitter handle, so GovTech Geek. And then um, I'd also encourage you to check out the Corporate Director Podcast. So you can find us at Director Pod. Um, you can send an email to podcast at diligent.com or to thought leaders at diligent.com. Any one of those ways you will you will find me. And I'd be happy to connect with you. Sweet. I'm going to do it right away. One last question behind you, because you guys can't see this, right? Because it's a podcast. <laughs> but we each have bookshelves behind us. And I just noticed, does that say, is that a Philadelphia Eagles 
fandom thing behind you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So let me just get close to this camera. I am wearing my Dallas Cowboys. Oh, I don't Nikki, know. we were so close to being good friends. Say, we were, something we beautiful were so was happening close. here, Dottie. And it then. Was. <laughs> I know. Well, okay. In all fairness, I, I have to come clean. So my husband worked for the team for about seven years. And and during that time, I actually was the voice of an animated character for their weekly kids show. <laughs> so so Same I have thing. a bunch of stuff on my shelf from, from when I did that gig for about six years. <laughs> <laughs> I see. It says yeah. kids club. All That's right. right well, yeah. <laughs> it's not football season, so we're still friends. But um, <laughs> thank you so much, Dottie. This was a blast. And I, I can't wait to, to see, you know, what other folks do with what you've what you've given us here and, and, and what you guys are able to do with uh, with you at the helm of, of thought leadership there at Diligent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.